Good evening, all, and welcome. Happy Friday! I'd like to extend a huge thank you to my members who actually selected today's video. If you would like to join for some exclusive perks, you can obviously just press the join button right there. Thank you all. But for now, it's time to get comfortable, grab your bed sheets, and let the darkness take control. When I was a little girl, between six and eight, I went with my mum to visit an aunt of hers. I was bored, and as a little girl visiting an old lady's house, I had wandered up to the second story of the house to play by myself. There was this big balcony up there with these sliding glass doors, and these really floaty, flimsy curtains that were over them. I decided that it would be great fun to twirl around these curtains and then walk away and let them drag off my face. Little kids, as you do. Now, the problem is that these curtains were right above the stairs. There were no railings or anything. It was just a straight drop eight feet down to the first floor, onto the hard as hell stairs. Little me didn't think anything about this during my game. So, after a couple of goes at it, I start twirling again curtains over my eyes so I can't see anything, and start walking. And then I felt a hand grab the back of my shirt, pulling me back hard enough to stop walking. And then another hand, a very distinct hand, grab the curtain over my face and pull it back to show that I was standing right at the edge of the drop-off. Thing being, when I turned around thinking it was my mum or aunt, there was absolutely no one there. Not in the room, not near me, nothing. So I screamed like a banshee and ran downstairs wailing. That was when my mum's aunt decided to tell me and my mum that like 80 years ago in the house, a woman had died on the second floor a few days before her wedding from whatever young women died of in the early 1900s. And she'd never hurt anyone, but sometimes they'd see her standing by the window looking out or just randomly roaming around the second floor. I mean, it was actually nice of her to stop me from breaking my face open on the stairs, but it was still pretty overwhelming for me as a kid who had no clue. My grandfather passed away a few weeks after I was born. Never met the guy, never knew what he looked like. When I was five years old, I started to see this man in our rocking chair. I called him the rocking chair man. My parents thought it was that imaginary friend stage, but it started to bug them when I told them every single day. They finally questioned me about it, and I told them every detail I could remember, and finally they showed me a picture of the man. It was my grandfather. To this day, and I'm 22 now, every time I dream he's in the background somewhere. I remember when I dreamed about my high school graduation and looked in the stand and saw him there with my parents. I like to think he's just watching out for me and being there when he's not really there. This has made me a true believer in the paranormal. When I was 13, I experienced the ghost of my grandmother. She died in her sleep while taking a nap on the living room couch. Afterwards, according to my father and grandfather, every now and then you can hear her make the trip from the bedroom to the kitchen and open the refrigerator door. A trip she made many times when she was alive. At first, I thought my father and grandfather were making this up, having fun at my expense. A few years later after she passed, my father and I went to spend the weekend with my grandfather. My father and I slept on the living room couch. It opened into a double bed. The same couch my grandmother died on. My grandfather left the house to go to a next door neighbor's house to play poker. My father and I went to bed in the living room, and my father went right to sleep. I laid awake reading a magazine. After a while, I heard the noise of the back bedroom being pulled open. I heard the sound of shuffling feet, and I heard the creak of the floor directly in front of the bathroom doorway. I heard more shuffling feet, then I heard the fridge door being pulled open, and I heard the sound of a glass bottle in the fridge. The door clink against each other, Back then, they were still putting soft drinks in glass bottles. And feeling thirsty, I decided to go out of bed and join my grandfather in the kitchen for a cold drink. 
but when I arrive, I am all alone. I was puzzled. I could have sworn I heard my grandfather walk from the bedroom into the kitchen and open the fridge. That's when I remembered that he wasn't home. He was at the neighbor's house and had not returned. And that's when I remembered the ghost story. And a cold chill went down my spine. I raced from the kitchen into the living room and leapt over my sleeping father into my side of the bed. I then went to sleep. I don't know for how long, but I woke up with a start and felt a feeling of paralysis take over my body. I was frozen. I was lying on my right side and it took me a while to work up the courage to turn my head to the left. My head was covered by a blanket. There was a shadow being cast on it. The shadow had the outline of a head and shoulder of a woman with a beehive hairdo. My grandma used to have a beehive hairdo for years, even after it went out of style up until she died. And I heard heavy breathing coming from the shadow. I had to work up the courage to move one of my hands to remove the blanket. And when I did, the paralyzing fear was gone, as was the shadow and the sound of heavy breathing. My father was still sleeping, and I pulled the blanket back over my head and slept on, only to wake up again on my right side. The paralyzing fear was back. Forcing myself to turn my head, the shadow was back. So was the heavy breathing. Again, I had to summon up all my courage to move my hand and take the blanket off my face, only to find nothing there and the crippling fear gone. I went through this same routine the entire night, I lost count how many times it happened through it, maybe a dozen, maybe more. The next morning I told my father what happened to me through the entire night while he slept. The sounds of the bedroom door opening, the shuffling feet, the fridge door opening, no one in the kitchen, and being awakened with paralyzing fear. The shadow, the heavy breathing, the repeat performances throughout the night. I kind of expected him to tell me I was just seeing and hearing things, but instead he smiled. That was grandma, he said. One Sunday morning, I was in my kitchen having a cup of tea with my wife. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw what I thought was my three-year-old daughter, basically a small blonde girl in a white nightie, walk out of the front room and into the entrance hall. I went to see what she was doing, and when I got there, no one was there. I walked back into the kitchen and said to my wife, something along the lines of, I'm bloody seeing things. I could have sworn I saw Amelia walking to the front door, but when she got there, there was no one to be seen. My wife was all like, you're joking. The same thing happened to me and my mum the other day. She explained how the same thing happened to them in the exact same spot with the mysterious girl taking the exact same route. In fact, so convinced that they had seen our daughter that they crept into the entrance hall after her to make a jump, but there was no one there. It didn't end there though. A few months later, we saw a post on a local Facebook page saying, I had a lovely childhood growing up at our address. I've been really keen to speak to whoever lives there now, particularly if they've had any experiences with the paranormal. I direct messaged the poster and asked if she had ever seen anything untoward without giving any indication of what we had experienced. Lo and behold, her and her sister used to see a little blonde Victorian girl in a white nightie standing outside their bedroom door or walking through the house. She related how initially they would think that it was the other sister, but they would go to investigate and find no one there. I'm a very cynical person by nature and did not previously believe in the paranormal, but now I have no alternate explanation. I walked into my mum's bedroom when I was about eight, and when I turned to where I thought she was, there was a woman ghost dressed in 30s-ish clothes, bending over and looking at the wall, as she seemed to be putting an earring in. It was super clear, and when I gasped, she actually turned and looked at me, and then seemed as surprised as I was before vanishing. I really wondered to this day if that woman 50 years before saw a ghost girl walk in while she was putting on her earrings. When I was younger, I remember waking up to an empty house. There was a note on my TV with a hundred dollars saying they all left to LA. 
My parents had a computer in their room, and I would talk to my friends on MySpace and listen to music through YouTube. I was home alone for the weekend, and when I had to take a potty break, I came back and sat down. Right before I was going to click resume for the music to start playing, I swear I heard someone get right up off the bed, as if they were behind me, like someone was sitting on the bed and got up and left. The only noise that you would hear is when you would sit up or stand up, kind of like the mushy sound the mattress makes. Another time, I spent the night at a friend's house. His parents were very anal about having friends over. His parents had left to another state for an emergency, leaving their son home alone. Apparently, he had played Ouija board with friends, and ever since the house was haunted, he had invited me and another friend over to spend the night. As everyone was asleep, I was too scared to pass out. Eventually, I heard a door open upstairs, and started to shove my friends awake. Nothing. They were out cold. Then I heard footsteps coming down the stairs, step by step, slower and slower. As soon as they get to the final step, my friend wakes up and there's a pause. Trevor, who the hell is here? Oh, it's just the ghost. He'll leave us alone. After he passes out, the footsteps rush back upstairs and the door slowly closes. The next morning, he shows me the Ouija board hidden in a compartment, where to this day his parents never knew or found out about. When I was 18, I moved away from home in California to attend college in the Seattle area. In order to make money, I took a lot of odd jobs such as landscaping, working events, and custodial work. For a few months in the winter of 2007 to 2008, I worked to church as a custodian. This was an old church with a storied history. The carpets hadn't been updated since the 70s. As evidenced by the avocado green and galaxy gold colors, which really just looked like shades of baby poop after feeding them mashed up vegetables. In the basement, they built a classroom and ran a small private school. I was the night custodian, so I cleaned the entire building from about five until everyone left at roughly ten. By five thirty every day, I was the only person in the building. It didn't bother me much. I was new in the area and didn't have much of a social life, so I would just put on my headphones and work. I'd usually finish pretty quickly, and then run out the clock playing the electric drums in the sanctuary. If you're unfamiliar with the Seattle area, there are two words to best describe the deep winter months: wet and dark. It gets dark very early, and the rain is the type which soaks your soul. There is nothing on you that doesn't get soaked, even if you're just running outside to throw the trash away. So this particular night, I was in the basement cleaning the classrooms, as I liked to finish them first, while there was still some sunlight shining through the windows, which were at ceiling level, as this was a basement. But I had a late start today, so the sun was already down and it was dark. I had forgotten my iPod this time. So I was humming and whistling and singing to reduce the very lonely feeling that would always come up with me when down there. I was vacuuming a classroom, and had just turned the vacuum off when I heard what sounded like a woman singing in another classroom. There was a music teacher at the school, so I figured she was staying late in one of the classrooms I hadn't gotten to yet. When I brought the vacuum out into the hall to move to the next room. I was whistling that famous song from Disney's animated Robin Hood movie. You know the one. You're probably hearing it in your head right now. When I finished, I could distinctly hear a muffled woman's voice saying, "That's a good one." I then decided to follow and see who was eavesdropping on my whistling. When I opened the door to the classroom, from which the voice came, there was no one inside. And there was no chance they slipped out unnoticed, as it was a small hallway with about six classrooms, three on each side, and I was standing there when I heard the voice. This got me a bit freaked out, but I remembered my dad telling me on a backpacking trip once that the brain can't interpret the random sound of water in a stream, so it creates a false sense of hearing something you're familiar with, like people talking or music. He told me this on a trip when we were alone in the back country, and I swore I heard a mariachi band off in the distance when we were camping near a stream. 
This was one of those nights in Seattle where the rain was so heavy that no matter where you are inside, you can hear the water falling off the overflowing gutters on the ground. So I figured that was what happened. My brain heard the water falling and created a false sound memory to interpret the randomness of it. So, feeling a bit relieved, I continued on with my menial tasks. When I was cleaning the bathroom, I heard a very loud whistling coming from the hallway. This was unmistakable. There was no full sound memory at work this time. The hairs on my neck quickly stiffened and I rose slowly, almost like I was paralyzed with fear. I had a co-worker who split the week work with me, so we were there together for part of one of our shifts. I figured he must have used his key to get in on his night off to prank me. I came out of the bathroom into the hallway and said, Hey, Isaac, is that you? And just as soon as the words left my mouth, I heard a woman's voice, clear as day, say, It's me, silly, as if she was mere feet away. But there was no one there. I promptly noped the heck out, leaving the classrooms uncleaned and the vacuum still in the hallway. I called Isaac to make sure he wasn't somehow pranking me, and he said he was in his dorm room, and I could hear our dorm mates in the background, so I knew he was telling the truth. I told him to come pick me up since I didn't have a car and a ghost was trying to murder me. He came and bought me some booze to calm my nerves, which I was thankful for. He told me I was just feeling spooked because of the nature of the building at night and being alone in it. I told him if he helped me finish cleaning tonight so that I wouldn't get fired for leaving, he could see for himself. So he worked on finishing the top floor, which took all of half hour. We drank a little more and headed down to the basement with warm bellies, ready to face the poltergeist. It was silent in there except for the rain flowing out from the gutters outside. We split up and were doing different classrooms. I purposefully sent him to the one where I heard the voice earlier, and about 30 seconds after he came flying out of the classroom saying we had to leave right now. I asked him what he heard, and he told me he felt a cold hand grasp his shoulder when he was looking at some of the children's artwork on the wall. This was enough for me. We hauled us out of there and quit the next day. When the boss asked us why, we told him what happened. He told us he had video evidence of us drinking on the job, which we overlooked as there were a few cameras in certain areas, and that he was gonna fire us anyway. I told him good luck with the ghosts and to maybe have a priest come and exorcise the place, albeit sarcastically. That was the last time I ever worked a custodial job where I had to be alone at night. When I was young, about three or so, my great-grandmother passed away. She died in the middle of the night in her sleep, so no one in my family found out about the death until the morning. However, in the middle of the night, the night she died, my mother came in to check up on us to make sure I was sleeping. She found me sitting in my bed staring into the corner of the room. When she asked me what was wrong, I said that there was a lady in the corner of the room. My mum told me that nothing was there, but I kept insisting there was a lady standing in the corner of my room watching me when I tried to sleep. This obviously freaked my mum out, and she kept coming in to check on me every hour or so. We found out in the morning that my great-grandmother died, and my family believes that the lady I saw standing in the corner of the room was her, saying her last goodbyes to me before she passed on. My wife and I were asleep one night, and I awoke suddenly, and felt like someone was at the foot of our bed. I opened my eyes and saw a woman standing there. She slowly turned towards me and stared, but not being fully awake yet, my brain couldn't fully get afraid, but was instead curious and confused as to why there was another person in the room. I sat up and slowly reached towards the woman, trying to figure out if she were real or not. When my hand reached her face, she vanished. My wife woke up at this point and asked me what I was doing. All I could say is that I thought I saw something. We both laid back down, facing each other and closed our eyes, when not a minute later we both heard this guttural roar slash growl that sounded like a mix between a lion, a bear and a howler monkey, emanating from behind our headboard. There's nothing behind that wall since it's an outside second story wall, and she immediately began screaming, and I searched the house from top to bottom. We never found out what made that noise. 
and it took us a long time before we could sleep in our bedroom again. This took place about nine years ago in a little town called Parkdale, Oregon. At the time I lived in a hundred year old cottage with gardens in the middle of town, a population of roughly 50 people. The house was a classic rent gingerbread house with a massive view of Mount Hood and really cool gardens. The bathrooms had an enormous clawfoot tub and had been a mortuary tub, really long to accommodate stiff dead bodies. My grandmother loved soaking in the tub. We co-rented the place with a mentally unstable person. We knew they were unstable, but we didn't know they were dark, who probably brought the toxic spirits into the house with them because they have had a lot of bad luck in their family, including their dad jumping out of a window because he believed he was being chased by witches, and the sudden death of their brother and so on. But here's the story. I was sleeping in my bed, and at around 3am I was awoken by a glowing light. I opened my eyes, turned my head, and there in the middle of the room was a little man about three feet tall wearing a little jumpsuit. Description? Blue suit with white stripes. He was also wearing a pair of black dress shoes. His hat was like Loki's helmet from Marvel, but instead of gold, it was orange, with white polka dots and connected at the chin. His face held an ear-to-ear -ear smile, and his eyes were tiny black dots. I sat on my bed completely petrified, staring at this thing that, might I add, had no nose. He stood there staring at my mum. I called out to her who said, oh my God, in her sleep. After a while, I finally returned to slumber. The next morning I told my mum about it who didn't believe me. My grandmother did, and she had drawn him several times. She loved the experience and had me retell it countless times. She also constantly lost her car key, sunglasses, and had her wallet hidden multiple times by the entity in the house every time she'd come to visit me. We would go and look for the items, turn the whole house upside down. She would get really snippety. And then out of nowhere, the items would appear on the high counter where she'd left them originally, which was very far from my grasp. We credited the cowboy because I saw him in the laundry room and he was a shadow man type thing with a cowboy hat and a big pair of boots. He was just on the wall, was very tall, and then he slid down the wall into the floor and was gone. What's really creepy is that after we left the cottage and moved closer to the city of Hood River, we randomly ran into an acquaintance who said they were now renting our old place, that they loved the cottage and gardens. So we asked them how they were enjoying it, and they said that it was haunted, and that they were in the laundry room filling up the dryer, when they turned around to see a full-blown apparition standing there, a cowboy, vest, jeans, boots, and a hat. Me, my mum, and my grandmother all have also had tons of experiences, but that one was the scariest by far. My old house in New Brunswick, New Jersey was haunted by the spirit of an old Italian woman. According to my mum, she was making Italian food. I don't remember what, but it was a complicated recipe she'd never made before, and she heard an elderly female voice with an Italian accent call from the master bedroom to use condensed milk instead of low-fat milk for the sauce. From that point on, no one in the house made Italian food that was less than excellent. My uncle took his own life before I was born. It was extremely hard on my mum, and for a long time she locked all photos of him away and never spoke about him. My little brother would talk about a man that visited him at night. This started pretty much as soon as he could talk coherently. Apparently the man would come and talk to him, and hold him, until he fell asleep. My little brother loved this guy, but my mum wasn't a big fan and found it really creepy, and yes, she made sure there wasn't some guy sneaking into my brother's room at night. When my brother was about seven, we were looking at a photo album at my grandma's. My brother points to a photo and says, that's the man, the one who visits me late at night. It was our late uncle, kind of related. The uncle and my mum had a lot of paranormal experiences and a lot of prophetic dreams, 
My mum still doesn't talk about him much, but she told me that once that uncle dreamt of me and my brother long before either of us had been conceived and before my parents had met. He described us perfectly to my mum. Everything he said was true. Mum also saved a life once thanks to a prophetic dream. I also have a weird paranormal man that visited me at night, but it was certainly not my uncle, nor a benevolent entity. But that is a story for another time. I once saw a ghost, a woman pushing a baby in a stroller. I didn't look at it for long, as I'd been previously told not to stare at ghosts and to not disturb them, so I did just that. Years later, I was amongst a gathering where we were exchanging ghost stories. One of my friends shared his story of a relative who had shared a story with him. To my surprise, his relative saw exactly what I had seen in the same vicinity, to where I had seen the same ghost. I couldn't believe it. My wife has claimed to see several ghosts in our apartment. I don't know if it's real because she typically sees them in the middle of the night when she wakes up, so I personally think it could be dreams, but she swears up and down that it's not. She says that she pinches herself in everything to make sure it's not a dream, and that our dog sees them too. Once about a month ago, she said she woke up and saw the ghost of a woman standing over me while I was sleeping. She again said that she was sure she was awake and not imagining things, but she said that she sensed that the ghost meant no harm, so she rolled over and went back to sleep. It would also make sense because occasionally our dog would look at things that we couldn't see, and certain objects would get moved in our apartment when we went there and didn't touch them. Of course, there could be other explanations. But overall, my wife is fairly convinced our apartment is haunted. And while I am suspicious, to say the least, I am slightly inclined to believe her. Since then, my wife has gotten into a lot of mysticism slash pagan stuff, and has put a protection ward around our apartment. Since she has begun to do that, the paranormal stuff has not been occurring. I don't know what to think of it myself, but I thought you guys might appreciate knowing. I've had a few creepy things happen to me. At the time, my ex and our son had just moved into a house, fairly old, but nice overall. My sister and her boyfriend at the time also moved in, as at the time they needed an in-between home until they found their own place. The first odd thing we noticed was in my son's room. There was what looked like a child's painting of a sunflower with a name above it, which we thought was odd, because wouldn't that get painted over before new people moved in? Wasn't sure about the fundamentals of all that, so for the time being it wasn't bothering us, so we left it. Everything was fine for a while, but then a series of odd events began to occur. The first thing we noticed was on an afternoon when my girlfriend and I had the house to ourselves. We were laying down in bed, preparing to take an afternoon nap, when we heard the unmistakable sound of the pitter-patter from a child running through the hallway. Now if you're a parent, I guarantee the sound is unmistakable when you hear it. We both looked at each other in surprise without saying a word, and we both recognized that the sound was exactly what we thought it was. I looked through the house. Nothing. The next incident was even odder. My son and I loved to watch regular show all through his early years. My son is around three during these events. I mean, we watched it all the time. It was our go-to show. I loved Pops and so did my son. We even had a stuffed Benson doll. Well, one night we were all asleep. I had my PC and monitor close to the bed. When all of a sudden, without the monitor turning on at all, Regular show just kicks on full blast in the middle of the night. Now if you own a computer and understand that even if the show had opened up ready to go, if I'd have hit spacebar or something to unpause it in the monitor, it would at least turn on. If the PC was on sleep mode, which it was. However, none of the above were applicable, and yet the show was still turned on at max volume. I groggily get up confused, start messing with the computer until the screen isn't turning on, and suddenly it just stops with no explanation. And finally, the weirdest thing of all. So my son's room has a window which faced the front of the house. So whenever I returned home from work, he would often run into his window on the outside of the blinds and see me coming in. It always made my day to see that. Well, one day I'm pulling him from work 
and there's the little baby boy right there at the window with his fingers on the glass looking at me. At the time, I sort of noticed he looked like he was in a shadow, almost as if he were hidden in black and white. I really didn't think anything of it at the time, but looking back, I couldn't help but notice that small detail. So I walk into the house and my sister's boyfriend is there. I ask how my son's been, and he looks at me confused and says that he's with my sister at the park with my girlfriend. I look at him confused and say I just saw him at the window. I walk into his room and there's no one there. But I knew I had just seen him. Or at least I had seen a child there looking at me. It really stuck out with me. I was out back at my friend's having a few beers. And I went inside to use his bathroom. I am sober at this point. Well, I turned the corner to the hallway to his bathroom. And there stood an older woman in all white with a walker, like the stereotypical ghost pale white. We made eye contact, and the reptile part of my brain just went, oh hey, his grandma's here. We should leave a BMP outside. Meanwhile, all I said to her was, sorry, and went back outside. Now me being the naive 18 year old I was, I just assumed she came over for the night, and we didn't notice, no big deal, right? Wrong. I had met his grandma previously, and she had passed about a year prior to the gathering. It clicked the next day when I asked him how she got in without us noticing, and then he told me that she'd passed away, and that they've occasionally heard her walk us scrape on the kitchen floor at night. Now I didn't feel threatened or anything like that. It was more of a, gotta get back outside and pee, you dumbass. She was a sweet lady as far as I could remember. My black cat Smokey, who was my best friend, passed away six years ago. I remember the day I got her. We arrived at this lovely couple's home to adopt a tabby kitten for my brother. My twin sister and I, who were nine years old at the time, loved the show Sabrina the Teenage Witch, and we desperately wanted a black cat, and they happened to have some black kittens, but said that they couldn't seem to find them and they think that the female kitten was hiding because she was the most shy of the lot. We were so upset, and as we could not wait any longer, we got into the car with my brother's tabby, and as we were about to drive away, we heard someone calling and running towards us holding a little black kitten. They found her just before we left. It was like fate. From then on, it was the start of an unbreakable bond that will carry on after death and into our next lives together as I believe she is one of my angels who was sent down to keep me going and not give up on life as I would continue to struggle with severe depression, social anxiety and suicidal thoughts and attempts, which she would make me stop from. Before I'd swallowed too many pills, she'd either threaten to eat them herself or lie on top of them. What I realized was that she felt like an outsider, as did I. She was not social and very shy of new people, and she hated other cats. I never knew why until much later. She also moved from one person in my family to the next, not too sure who to settle for until I was the last one she spent time with to see if I was the right fit. And it was. She stuck to me like glue from then on. She'd follow me around the house like a dog. My family would laugh at the two of us, and she wouldn't allow me out of her sight. How she'd wait at the door for me to go home from school and run towards me, meowing loudly as I returned. She would call me before bed, if I was up past 10 p.m. We have to go to bed, meow me. Waking me up a few minutes before my alarm would go off around 5 a.m. so that I could let her out and use the sand toilet. She'd be back soon watching me put my shoes on and swat at the laces or listening to me babble about the crazy dreams I'd had. Once I came home in tears, I'd had the worst day. I was terribly bullied at school and I wanted to end my life. So I sobbed and sobbed, my face in my pillows, and she hopped on the bed next to me and lied next to me. I went to cuddle her, put my arms around her and my face in her fur. She was my comfort. And since I didn't have a good relationship with my mother nor siblings, she was both when I needed it. I was disappointed when she got up in irritation and went to lie further away. 
I just stayed there. I was with my arms still crossed around an open space where her body was moments ago. I think about how alone I was a lot. She would surprisingly come back and stood there for a while, and I glanced from the corner of my eye to look down at her, with those green, kind eyes, as if she were deep in contemplation. She walked over and laid in my arms and started purring furiously, which wasn't like her at all. She hated being snuggled unless it was for scratches. I felt warmth move through her to me, and I knew that she was being selfless and was concerned for me, and felt guilty for leaving me when I needed her the most. She made the choice to come over and purr and cuddle with me like a mother cat would for an injured kitten, and it warmed my heart. She even loved small critters. I had a hamster that my brother said was aggressive called Kimmy. She was gentle and sweet with me. She was fat and brown, a teddy bear hamster. And Smokey was obsessed with this tiny bear. They became best friends. Kimmy wasn't like other hamsters. There was knowing to her. She was playful and silly. It was winter. I told her I was going to go to bed and stroked her. She was weak and old at this point. She fell over, and it broke my heart, but I knew she was old and had arthritis at this point. I carried her to bed, planning to take her to the vet in the morning. She was fine the whole day until now, and we cuddled as we normally did, and in the morning she woke me up as she usually did too. I got up and felt something was different. I went to let her out. Just before she walked away, I knelt down and stroked her, and asked if she was okay. I was worried about her and told her it's too cold to go out now and that she should hurry back to bed. When she left, I checked my phone, 3 a.m., much earlier than usual. I felt sadness and concern as I got back under the covers. I waited until that evening, not able to sleep. She still never returned, and then I knew. I went outside and called and called and called. The neighbors came out and asked if I'd like to help, and she hugged me and told me that she was sorry. She knew we loved each other very much and said how sad it must be. I knew she wouldn't be coming home. I cried on her shoulder because I didn't get to say a proper goodbye. As some of you may know, some cats like to leave when they know they're dying. I believe lions do this too. They like to go die alone and in peace. After we walked around for another hour calling, I went home. My fears realized. She never came home for a whole week. I looked everywhere and occasionally looking in the cupboards as she loved to sleep there. I was torn up and thought that I never got to say goodbye and was very upset by it. We'd been together for so many years. She'd watched me grow into a young adult, saved my life more than she knew, and I missed her every day and didn't stop crying at night thinking of her. Then it happened. I went to bed. I closed my window and my bedroom door and switched off the light and got in bed. I had literally just laid down and put my alarm on. Bear in mind that it had probably been a little over half a year since her passing when I closed my eyes when I immediately felt something jump on the bed. I got a fright. I jumped and sat up and looked around to lay back down, thinking I was imagining things. Then I felt something walk next to my legs, up towards me, and I froze. I was petrified, but not paralyzed. I didn't know if I should look or ignore it. I thought to myself, please don't be a demon. I had seen plenty of shadow people and had scary experiences in my life and I certainly didn't need more. That's when I felt paws walking on my thighs and onto my chest. Wait, what is this? I squinted and there was a cat figure, whiskers and all. It walked onto my chest, purring. It was smoky. I could recognize that soft, loving purr anywhere. I looked up, very excited, and then went to touch her and poof, she was gone. But I felt so much love and joy, and the tears were rolling down my cheeks. It was stupid of me to think that I could touch her, but the fact she chose to visit me in such a physical, vivid way, while I was fully awake, showed the trust we'd always had between us. It was special. I just said, thank you, 
I love you, Smokey. I hope whoever reads or hears this has a pet person slash guardian angel to know that they're always there with you and will never leave your side. Okay. I think me and my grandma can see spirits. Let me fill you in. It's not all the time and we don't have any firmly history of psychosis. Some of the creepy things I did as a kid convinced me. I remember when I was six or seven and I used to get really animated and excited every time my mum drove past the graveyard. She told me she'd hear me from the back seat say, Mum, look, a graveyard. Look at what's going on over there. And there was no one out there, but it was creepy. But the one instance I know was another experience that I had at that age. For some southern reason, we went to tour an old plantation including the slave quarters. I was the only person of colour in my class. They were all excited, but I felt uneasy. I had never been told about slavery or anything at that time. So to me it was just an old house. But when we stepped inside I saw this woman. There was a lady in a black gown that had a scowl that did not like us kids being in her house. I say that it was more like recalling a memory in my mind rather than seeing her directly like my classmates. But I know I'd never been here or seen this lady before, but I instantly knew what she looked like. I told my teacher there was a lady who was mad at us for being here at the top of the staircase. She dismissed it. As the tour guide took us around the house, which is now a museum, I saw a portrait of the lady. I shouted that I'd seen her before, and the guide looked confused, but kept on rambling. This was the wife of the house who lived here in the year 1850. At the end of the tour, we go to the slave's house, which was really step on a ramp and peer inside. There was only one house, but it had two rooms divided by an open doorway on the inside. The second I looked inside, I started crying. They were looking at me. There were a bunch of people in brown clothes looking at me, and they stood up against the wall stiff, scared to move. All the men were on one side of the room, and in the next, all the women. They saw me back. One or two men gave me looks of contempt. Looking back, it might have been an association of my slightly lighter skin with the household slave. And when the white kids began to noisily stick their heads beside me, they stopped making the face and stood against the wall. All of their demeanours were a combination of tense hypervigilance, worry, and a mental state you disassociate into when you have a form response. They weren't as hostile as the lady in the black dress. I didn't get a vibe that they were dangerous or anything. I just didn't expect to see them there, and they all looked so miserable. I was a mess, and of course, as the only kid of colour there, the optics looked bad, so they got me a honey stick from the gift shop to quell me on the ride back to school. When I told my grandma about it, she sat me down and told me about slavery. She didn't say she didn't believe me. She just told me that's what it used to be like. Understanding made me feel a little bit at ease, but that's the moment spirits made a lasting impact on me. I still don't like going into some older buildings, but even if I sense them, they just give off neutral vibes. No one really sad or evil like in the movies, and definitely not like the sad and evil I saw that day. My parents have recently bought this somewhat rundown duplex, and they decided that I should be the one to help get it back into shape. When I first saw the duplex, it didn't exactly feel right. I'm slightly in tune with the spirits. For the first visit, nothing unusual happened, except for the feeling of someone watching me. Then on the second visit is when it started to go down. I was chopping up old rotten bushes in the backyard when I looked towards the garage window, and I see what I think is my reflection. But it doesn't look right. It's off-center to where my reflection should be, and it's looking down at me. I quickly look away, realizing that it wasn't my reflection, and I looked back to find my reflection in a different place in the window and looking like a normal reflection. I shake it off as me just seeing things. Three visits later, I'm sweeping up a section of the duplex when I hear a tapping on the garage door. I'd walk over to the door and I knock three times. The tapping repeats what I knocked and I quickly run out of the duplex and drive away. 
a visit later, and grouting some tiles, and I start singing Beautifully Now by Zed. And 30 seconds into the song, I hear a very loud shh in my ear. I push it off as nothing. After I'm finished, I go back into the room and attempt to replace a phone jack, when I suddenly begin to hear a family talking in the main room. Then I shout, who's there? And don't get a response. I continue with replacing the phone jack, and the talking starts up again. I jump up and run into the main room and scream, this isn't your home anymore, move on. And I run out of the duplex and call it a day and drive away. A visit later, I'm reluctant to go back, but I do. I am not a few steps into the duplex when I pass the hallway, when out of the corner of my eye, I see the figure of my little sister running between rooms. I run back there to see what's got into the house, and I check the closets and the bathroom, but there's nothing. I give up for the day and drive home. I don't think I really want to return. Once when I was at my grandma's house, the kitchen door that had been deadbolted flew open. My grandma said, give Uncle George the chair and get him a beer. No one was there, but whenever the door would fly open, we learned to say hi to Uncle George and provide a beer and a chair. He was the former owner of the house and not an actual relative. He liked to visit when there was a lot of people and fun and playing cards. Hey guys, it's Mort here. Thank you so very much for listening. Here's to hoping that you enjoyed today's content. If you did, be sure to let me know. You all are aware that liking and commenting and even subscribing and bell iconing are very useful to any creator, so feel free to do just that. I do like me some good ghost stories. And if you like them too, you know, you can tell me about how you liked them. I am still working on a number of cool things in the background. I think the app is going to be ready for anyone with Android to download very soon, hopefully in these next few days. So keep that in mind. I will probably see you all tomorrow for a fat compilation of stories. Hoping to see you there. And uh, I am working on a different thing on a different channel, something completely different. I said in the secret message section on Wednesday's video, hoping to have that out tomorrow. I'll probably post a community post about it. It is wildly different to what I already do. So, you know, don't get shocked. But yeah, just leaving it out there for now. I think that's it from me. A huge thanks to my members, patrons and supporters on Coffee, whose names are on screen. You are amazing and I love you. But for now, take care, stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.